Welcome to the Ages of Rock podcast with your hosts, Bill Algy, Dennis Talbot, and Alan Tate. We are three guys who have one thing in common, a love of rock and roll. Our goal is to talk about all things rock. We hope you find this show intriguing, funny, and occasionally highly opinionated. Enjoy. Hey, welcome back to the Ages of Rock podcast. Um, I'm flying solo today, so um, God help anybody that's on this show, Josie. <laughs> anyway, um, so one of um you know f- doing this podcast get, we have the ability to get some people on sometimes that are people that we follow personally and really enjoy their music so josie scott um is somebody that i have followed for a number of years and um seen him a couple of times in in concert he probably remembers i i doubt really um but uh we're gonna talk about a little bit about that and it's kind of where he's been for the last little bit of years and he's back on the scene so ready to make some new music and get some stuff out there so josie welcome to the show man man thanks for having me brother man it's been a it's been a day <laughs> yes it so, has been a day here too man yep craziness so, yeah it's been a little crazy yeah so i you know for for full full disclosure i kind of scheduled the wrong time and <laughs> all kinds of stuff so thanks for being patient <laughs> man i really appreciate it but yeah, right. my my pleasure Cool. So, um, man, I'm trying to think back. I was looking back, and the first time I saw you, um, it was in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, God, I don't remember when it was. It was, the, it was at the Kentucky State Fair. Uh, Blackstone Cherry opened. Um, that was the first time I ever saw them. Um, the first time I ever saw you guys, too, because it was something I just never could get scheduled to, to work it out. So, Was that the show at the baseball field? It was the show at the baseball field. I remember field. that show. I remember that show. Yeah. I remember because we went out later that night to a club called the Rock Bar or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. And man, I had never seen so many beautiful people in one place in my life. Just the kindest, uh, coolest people and everybody was having fun and nobody was fighting or raising hell. And it was just, it was just kind of heavenly it was one of those rock and roll nights that you you just never forget cool that's good i'm just north of of louisville so we uh, try to catch those shows down there when we can there's some really cool places to 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 see shows down there so um but yeah i i uh, i took a buddy of mine who'd never heard of saliva at the time and had no idea and i'm like dude these guys are great you're gonna love them whatever and uh, i remember you walked out you had pinstripe pants on wingtip shoes and it's funny it's i remember that from the part and the guy's like are you my buddy's like are you serious I was like, this guy's gonna kick your ass <laughs> we were we were literally on the third row and you did a great job man it was it was freaking awesome <laughs> thank you those we guys had- in blackstone cherry are always uh the sweetest guys and we always had the best time with them they're good old southern boys and uh always were um just the most kindly mannered good old boys you know they always had some good southern cooking some good southern food going on and they're just the nicest fellas you know and uh man that drummer he was just he's just a pleasure to watch he's like watching you know i don't know he's like (laughs) watching a dynamo behind the kit he's just like watching a tornado (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was um i saw them again not not long ago maybe two years ago mm-hmm. they were on a triple bill and i can't remember who the headliner was but they did a great job it was I, I i really actually went to see them that was that was my main reason to go um but they did they did a really good job then too i've actually seen them twice since then so that was pretty cool so you're a southern boy yeah. too right so you're right from memphis right? is that correct yeah i was born and raised in memphis and uh um, I was actually born in the same hospital that Elvis was pronounced dead in Baptist <laughs> hospital. They've torn it down since then, since, uh, since I was born, uh, and Elvis died there. I think they tore it down in like 2015 or something. Um, but yeah, it's not even there anymore. Wow. And so me and my th- wife got married at Graceland. Really? That's pretty yeah, cool. We're big Elvis fans. Talk, talk about that. How did that? So can you do that? You can you can like reserve a spot or? 
Well, we didn't know we didn't know we could do that. Um, we met at a show in uh, here in Tulsa at a place called the Voodoo Room, and um, we dated for about a year. And uh, then we were like, we're we're we we have the coolest relationship. We don't ever have to get married. Screw all those idiots that get married and blah blah blah. And then. We just sent, I ended up proposing to her one night and I was, you know, and, and, uh, so we decided to get married and we're just, you know, in love with each other and, uh, like teenagers We're we've always been like Romeo and Juliet, just crazy about each other. And, um, we were going to get married at a golf course, um, and, this uh grammy event the memphis grammys were coming up they have like a local version of the grammys that they have every year and we went to this i invited her to go to this grammy event with me uh since she was my fiance and uh we got all fancy dressed up and got all gussied up as we say in the south and we went to this grammy event and there was all these um uh, you know, big time legends there. It was like uh, Ike Turner was there. Wow. And uh, Scotty Moore, Elvis's guitar player, was there. And DJ Fontana, Elvis's original drummer, was there. And uh, we got to talking backstage and we were telling Scotty Moore and uh, DJ Fontana how we were getting married pretty soon uh, down at this golf course in a, in a place called. Uh, Pickwick Lake down in uh, the Tennessee River and he goes well man he goes y'all are big Elvis fans he goes uh, DJ Fontana said why don't y'all just get married at Elvis's house and I was like what <laughs> he goes yeah he goes they got a little thing called the the chapel in the woods and um, it's right out the front door of Graceland right there in the on the grounds right there in the front yard basically they built a little chapel that holds about 150 200 people and um i was like you gotta be kidding me he goes yeah he goes i'll set it up for you he goes you just give him a call over there and uh and uh we'll have him take a meeting with you guys and see if you want to take a tour and if you're interested in doing it and i said man i i i don't need a tour i said i've had a tour i'm in and uh so we went and looked at the place and uh it was just perfect and we uh, started planning our wedding there and we ended up getting married at graceland wow how do you turn yeah, that down a, there's no way right. to turn that down it's like yes <laughs> yeah it was awesome wow and, uh, that's incredible one of the coolest things that happened was uh, the night before uh we had like a uh like a gentleman's toast type thing up at the uh, house and my guitar player at the time Chris Baldo, knew this girl that ran the place her name was Angie we we grew up with her and she started out as a tour guide there at Graceland and ended up running the place she was like the second in command to Lisa Marie wow and um so she invited us up there to to do this gentleman's toast thing and uh we were uh, up there in the front living room of Graceland and we were looking in Elvis's coat closet. She said, go ahead and open that coat closet and look in there. And, and uh, she said, that's the same way Elvis left it when he died. And so we opened up the coat closet and there's like his army helmet was in there. His army jacket was in there. There was some board games in there. And then up in the top of the closet, there was a set of billiard balls that went to Oh, you froze to the pool table your balls down and he picked up the eight ball and he goes this is for you elvis and he goes and held it up and i am not fooling with you the freaking lights clicked off and on <laughs> oh shit when he did that in oh, the whole in, in the entire house in graceland after he kissed that eight ball he goes this is for you, E. And it goes. Oh, man. It was awesome. Holy crap. 
Isn't that isn't that pretty cool? That is that is wicked cool, man. There's, there's and, and what was so funny is the girl Angie goes, "Oh, you just had an Elvis moment," and we all looked at each other like, "An Elvis moment? What's that?" And she goes, "Oh, it happens all the time. Happen yeah. all these little things happen all the time where you can feel his spirit and he's just you know some ghostly in uh, Graceland." <laughs> yeah, I've heard about the ghost of Elvis before, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty wicked, man. So I, yeah. you know, I, I keep telling my wife, I want to go to Vegas and we're, we just celebrate our 35th anniversary. And, oh, and congratulations. I, I, yeah. I want to go to Vegas and get married in the, uh, in the, in the kiss room there. They have a kiss room. You get married by Gene Simmons. I think it'd be kind of cool to get that done. Not by the real Gene Simmons, of course. And she's like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to do it for selfish reasons, but getting married to Grayson is pretty damn cool, though. <laughs> that would be that'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> so you're so you're a Kiss man. I am. Yeah, that's awesome, brother. Kiss is the whole reason I got into rock and roll. Um, when I was a a little boy, my dad was a preacher, and we used to in the seventies, as you know, families used to go have dinner with each other and play play a board game or something like that and and the the little kids would go run off and play in each other's rooms uh while the adults were you know playing monopoly or life yep. or whatever so i would always uh run off to this little kid named kevin brock he was my dad's assistant pastor's son and he was like the black sheep of the family and there's always one of those right yeah, he didn't he didn't go to church and he uh collected albums and he had like lava lamps in his room and fit these these big fish nets hanging from his ceiling and he he it was just like if heaven had a room when I was 6 years old it was this room and I would go in his room and he would let me go through his he had these big out, big wooden album crates from Peaches Records, and he would let me go through his albums. And he had all the Kiss solo albums and Alive One and um, uh, the first three albums, Dress to Kill, and uh, uh, all the all those albums. And I used to sit there and just look at the uh, the Destroyer album cover was my favorite. Oh yeah, because it was just it was just so colorful and so vivid and. Um, I remember um, getting a, a picture or, or having a picture of that album cover and taking it to school for career day. And I told the teacher, you know, kids were like, I want to be a fireman and I want to be a doctor. And when it came my turn, I held up a picture of that album cover and I said, I want to be this. I don't even know what this is, but I want to be that right there. <laughs> Whatever this is on Kiss's Destroyer album cover, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Well, I think you made it. <laughs> I, I sure tried. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about that. So what? What? Um, when did you get into the music business? I know that. So you guys got together what ninety six ish? Is that right? Yeah, we got uh, we got together around nineteen ninety six. Um, I had been in a band um, since nineteen ninety two. Uh, called Blackbone with some guys uh, around Memphis and uh, me and Cristobaldo were uh, sort of a package deal he was my rhythm guitar player and I was his lead singer uh, and we kind of around 1995 90, early 96 we knew that the Blackbone thing was was not going to work out and uh I told Chris, I said, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start over, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start over and just re-rack everything. And I'm gonna pick a new band name and I'm gonna go to all the best bands in Memphis and pick out all the best players I can find. And I'm gonna hand pick me a band. And I said, and I'll bring you, you know, I'll, uh, we'll, me and you will be a package deal. They'll have to take uh, if they want you, they'll have to take me. And if they want me, they'll have to take you. So we kind of shook on it. And um, after that, I went around and got uh, 
Wayne Sweeney, the lead guitar player, who was the best lead guitar player in Memphis for almost two decades before I even got him. He was in a band called TNA that was really big uh, around Memphis and uh, the regional area. They toured Atlanta, Nashville, and everything. And um, then uh, Paul Crosby, of course, was um, well. I'm, I'm I got to back up a little bit. Todd Poole, actually, uh, the the lead he was the lead singer of a band called Roxy Blue. Oh yeah, that had uh, they had gotten a deal on the Geffen uh, Geffen Records with uh, Tom Zutat, and um, he was just an incredible songwriter. I'd always wanted to sort of jam with him. Well, he was pl- he was going to play drums and let me be the singer. So I was like, well, cool, man, you know. So um, he played drums for a while and, and wrote songs, and then uh, we eventually uh, got around to um, – I wanted Dave Novotny really bad. He was in a band called Gemini Clan, and um, he was just the coolest bass player, you know, was an cr- incredible musician and really rocked out on stage and had an incredible stage show. So uh, eventually we ended up with uh, with me and Chris D and Todd Poole on drums and Wayne Sweeney on lead guitar and then Dave Novotny on bass. And then uh, for some reason – um as we got closer uh sort of to recording a, the first album and 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 getting a deal uh Todd uh, had to leave the band uh and the other drummer I wanted if if not Todd was uh Paul Crosby and uh his wife was going to make him quit the music industry and I drove across town <laughs> in my little crappy car and uh uh, drove to his wife's house and I said, Hey, I said, um, if you will trust me with your husband, I said, I promise you I'll get us a record deal and, uh, it just give him one more shot, you know, at the brass ring. And I said, you know, I don't want to be in a band of hometown heroes forever. I want to be in a, in a real worldwide, um, you know, national act or worldwide global act or whatever. And she was like, okay, he can have one more shot. And I was just, you know, um, so thankful to get him in the band. And um, then once we started uh, writing together, the first song we wrote was Dope Ride. And uh, we just immediately started writing great songs. And um, then I think it was another, after Paul got in the band and, I think 97, 98, it was another two years and uh, we just kept chugging along and uh, we put out our little independent album and we sold about 15, 20,000 copies and we were getting some airplay. There was two DJs there in Memphis at uh, 92.9 WMFS, I think was the radio station at the time. They started playing us on the local rock hour or whatever and then they just started putting us in regular rotation a couple of our songs and um we had started getting attention from different uh labels and uh, we had brian coleman come in and want to manage us on a handshake which was a real blessing he managed nickelback and uh a couple other big Canadian bands and he didn't have an American band. So, uh, and Brian was a real godsend for us. And, uh, we had, uh, Jim Zumwalt was our lawyer and we just put together a good team and we got turned down by every record label there was. We got turned down by Atlantic. We got turned down by Epic. We got turned down by RCA. We got turned down by Interscope. We got turned down, uh, by capital uh every one of them turned us down i think twice they uh did what they call passed they passed yeah and uh god that was heartbreaking to hear those words my mother told me one time she said if i had to suffer the kind of rejection you've suffered i would mop up the floors at a peep show (laughs) before (laughs) 
I was like, dang, mom, that's pretty gross. <laughs> that's pretty bad. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> but uh, she was, uh, you know, very supportive. And um, and right around that time, I had lost my dad in 1997. And, uh, you know, that was really, really heartbreaking. And um, around the year 2000, or around late 1999, uh, Island Def Jam just came out of nowhere and they said uh, we want to know who in the hell this band is in Memphis, Tennessee that's getting all this airplay and selling you know 10 or 20,000 units all by themselves with no distribution you know we it was just uh, it was just uh, word of mouth you know mm-hmm. we would go to the different record stores back when there was a such thing as a record store and we would put our stuff on the shelf and consign it, you know, to the record uh, stores. And uh, we'd go down on Bill street and we used to sit side by side with triple six mafia. Uh, They would be selling rap CDs on one side of the street and we'd be selling rock CDs on the other side of the street, literally dealing them out of our trunk. And, um, we were making pretty decent money actually because we didn't have anybody to yeah. pay, you know? So, uh, uh, and I think one, one mistake that we continually made was we just kissed the, the record companies, uh, asses. I mean, we just would, we would just kiss their asses and they would, fly us out to whatever city they were in and they would uh, put us in some big rehearsal room or uh, some place that they would rent. And then they would stand there with their arms folded and just to tell us we weren't good enough or we weren't what they were looking for. And do you think it was because they didn't think the? do you think it was because they didn't think the music they had heard transferred over to the live version? I mean, or is it just their death? (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't know. I never could figure it out. Um, but when when Island Def Jam told us, uh, they said, we'll fly you out to New York. We'll put you guys up in a, uh, a rehearsals. Uh, we'll get one of those big rehearsal stages and we'll put on a big showcase and we'll invite all the record label people out to come see y'all. And I remember being on the phone that day and I, I said, no. I said, we're not going to do that. I said, I'm not going to bring my band to New York City and have y'all put us up in some nice hotel and take us out to some nice restaurant for dinner and then for us to play a showcase for you while you guys stand there with your arms folded just to tell us we're not good enough or we're not what you're looking for. I said, I'm not going to go through that heartbreak again. I said, now, if you want to come to Memphis, and come to Bill Street and let me pack the Omni New Daisy with, you know, a thousand of our most dedicated fans and let me rock that place to the floor with my guys in saliva. I said, and then I will accept your no or yes. And there was this long, like, it felt like an eternity, but I think it was like, <laughs> 30 seconds, 15 seconds of silence on the phone. And this was a, this was a call with like me, Brian Coleman, uh, the head of A&R, the other A&R guy and Lior Cohen, the CEO. So there was like 15 seconds of silence. And then I heard Leo, Lior say, okay, we can do this. We can, we can do this. He's this big old uh, Israeli uh, special forces guy. Oh, wow. And, um, and he goes, Josie, I can do this for you. We will come to Memphis. I was like, yes. So they came to Memphis and, um, the rest is history, man. They came to the Daisy, just like I asked them to. And I sold that place out and we worked really hard and got a thousand of our most rabid saliva fans up in there. And, and we we rocked it to the ground. It was a magical night, man. And we just went out there and played the best twelve or thirteen songs we could muster up. And um, the next thing you know, the ball was rolling. And they came back and seen us again. They had already decided to sign us, 
and they came back and seen us again. And then once our lawyer and their lawyer, they went back and forth on a few details for about a month. And then they came back the third time. And that was the signing party. That was the party where we got to actually sign the paperwork. And um, they took us uh, at, right after our show. They took us uh, downtown to the Peabody and we uh, they they had a private party for us at the Peabody with this special guest. And they wouldn't say who the special guest was. And we were like, I wonder who the special guest is going to be. I wonder who it's going to be. I bet it's going to be one of his artists. And lo and behold, it was Lionel Richie. Dude. Wow. <laughs> Shit. Wow. And we were dumbfounded, man. Like this guy came out on stage with a little B3 like looking piano and him and his buddy, he had a piano and they slayed. Oh yeah. Just wow. murdered. Just, it was just hit number one hit after number one hit after number one yeah. hit. And it was just incredible. Another magical night, man. Man, you've been For pretty sure. lucky. You've had some pretty, very cool experiences. I'm sure. Well, like Aver I'm sure there's a like lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, not cool experiences that have happened yeah. too. I was going to say, like Abraham Lincoln says, "For every yes, I heard a thousand no's." Yep, uh, for <laughs> sure. That's really cool, though. You know, I think that I think that helps some of those bands that really struggled work a little harder and and really kind of uh, appreciate it a lot more than some bands that get you know signed immediately. You know, all that stuff in the '80s. You know, I big '80s rock guy. You know, there were this cookie cutter band stuff that was happening, you know, everybody sounded the same and, you know, it's kind of like that a little bit now on the radio for sure. What very little radio I listen to. Um, right. You know, it's, it's kind of like that too. Uh, it, but yeah, I think it makes people just really, it makes you hungry. It makes you work harder. Um, that's cool. But that's, Absolutely. that's incredible. Great. That's a great story. Thank so, you. So tell me about, so tell me about, um, you know, I've been, I've been, like I said, I've been a huge Slider fan. I've got, I've got everything up to, uh, I've got the, I've got, I was thinking about CDs. Um, I'd love to have some vinyl, by the way. If you guys ever decide to put that stuff out on vinyl, I am like going to be in debt. <laughs> so we're, we're working on that. Um, or I'm working on that now with uh, my solo stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm working on getting something done right now in, in vinyl because I love vinyl too. I'm, I love to collect vinyl as well. So yeah, I've got a, I got a few. You can probably see them over there. Nice. There's about four hundred, well, probably close to five hundred now sitting over. Oh, there. you got them all bagged and tagged too. I got them bagged and tagged because if I don't, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> if I don't, to be honest, what happens to me is I. So I have an app on my phone, and I'll go somewhere and I'll like I'll grab it and start walking around with it, and I'm like, if I don't check to see if I have this. I've done it. I bought like three or four. I got two or three copies of stuff over there because I don't either have access to internet whenever I'm at a show, you know, at, at a record show or something like that and pick something up. And then I've got two copies of something or three copies of something. But at least, at least usually it's two, two copies of something that's good. <laughs> Not two. I was going to say, I, I wonder how many times I've bought Back in Black. Oh, you know, the only Back in Black album I have is the original one I, I bought. The original. Wow. Way back, yeah, way back in the day. <laughs> that's the only wow. that's the only back in black album I've ever bought. So I had gotten rid of all my vinyl at one point in time, except for I kept all my Kiss records and I kept a few others. And the few others I kept, one of them was AC was back in black, and that is one of the few that I have from back in the day. So How old a, are you, Bill? I'm fifty six. Fifty six. So you're six years older than me. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's about right. You'd have been, uh, let's see, I was nine years old in eighty one. So I was in. I was so a freshman 15. in high school. Yeah, I was going to say you're about fourteen or fifteen. So yeah. you were. See, I'm jealous, man, because you were the at the coolest age at the coolest time. I was born too late, man. I was born too late. I wanted to be so much older back then because I wanted to be old enough to go to Kiss concerts and you know go see Queen and all that and I just wasn't old enough. But now you do that for your kids, right? So you make sure oh, your kids absolutely. get to experience that stuff. So, you know, absolutely. It, so I I went I went my first time I went to see Kiss was in it was on uh 
was uh, January 22nd in 1978. Oh. Uh, and I went with my dad. It was a live two tour. Oh, yeah. so jealous. <laughs> in Evansville, Indiana, which is not terribly far from Memphis, but that's where I, that's where we live. And, um, but I have made it a, I've made it a point to take every one of all three of my kids have went the same age I was when I went the first time. Nice. Um, and so, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think people that are into music and, and, and you included, when you have those, those, those moments, mm-hmm. you know, that you just, you can't get away from it. You know, you right. just, you just can't. And, um, every one of them have had some kind of a special event that's occurred as well. I mean, my, my middle son, we were in, I know this interview about you. I'll just tell you a quick story, but we're, we're in Chicago, Illinois. I took him. That was his first time to go it was in Chicago at the United center. Um, and, uh, we were sitting there and we ended up cause we, we met some people that were sitting right behind us that worked for A and E when Gene Simmons had his show on, uh, on A and E and they invited us to go back and meet Gene. Wow. That was his first show. I'm like, this dude, interview this is, is never- not about me, man. This interview is about us, bro. You got <laughs> the, the coolest stories, dude. But the, you, but the, like the like th- I said, you were the coolest age at the coolest time ever. But the funny thing was, is the next show I took him to, I'm like, dude, this is never going to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't even. Who do you think we're going to meet? We're meeting nobody. Because <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> that was a one time deal. But uh, yeah, you know, you, you, it's, uh, you know, I think it. I think the cool part about music is just it puts you in a special place. And, and it, it, funny, you know, another quick, another quick story. I met Gene year, years later, just a couple of years ago again for the, another another time. And and um, I told him I had a record album I wanted him to sign. I had actually Dress to Kill, which is one of my favorite early records. Oh. And um, I asked him to sign it, but I, he signed some pictures, the pictures that were taken of my son and him and I whenever we met him the first time. And um, he said, why do you have that piece of crap album? Actually, he said, "What's that? What do you have that piece of shit album?" And I said, "I said uh, because I I love this record." And he goes, he "Goes no, you don't love that record. Nobody loves records." And I go, "No, I love this record." He goes, "No, you love the way it makes you feel and where it takes you when you listen to it." But it sounds like shit, and you know it. And I'm like, "Wow!" I'm like, yeah, that's true. It doesn't sound very because because but it really is all about how it makes you feel, right? And I'm like, "Yeah, it really is." And I'm telling you, it was. It's one of those moments you sit there and you go, yeah. So I, you know, music, I've got hundreds of CDs over there and, you know, MP3s out the butt. But, you know, I think to your point, it's, it's about those special moments that you create in time. And, you know, you, it's just, it's just really cool. And it's cool. It's great. It's great for me to be able to talk to people about that stuff and, and have artists on the show that, that value that and value the, the fans and stuff like that. So thanks, man. Yeah, man, it, it was it was like almost like dude it was like a baptismal like experience man when i first walked into an arena and just hearing the the roadies up there testing the kick drum like and i could feel it in my chest like yeah going, doo, doo, doo. i was like dude i was like matthew mcconaughey <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, it was just, it was an experience. It was a spiritual experience, bro. Yeah. I yep. can't put it. And the lights go down and you hear, you know, 15 or 20,000 people scream at one time. Like it takes you, it's otherworldly, man. It takes you to another dimension. And I think that's what music was always meant to do throughout history. I think it was probably like that the first time, you know, all the way back to like the Romans or, or, you know, Shakespeare or or the first time stringed instruments or horns were played in some kind of, you know, acoustic place that was built for to move that sonic sound upwards. I think, you know, I think from that moment on, it was a spiritual experience and was meant to be a spiritual experience. Quincy Jones said one time, when you, when you, when you get, when people say they get goosebumps, he calls that God's wand. Oh, nice. I'll have to remember that. Isn't that good? That is good. That is good. So what's it like being on the other side of that? What's it like being on 
you know, I've always emulated people like that and, and, and wanted to be in that environment. I don't have, you know, I have no talent at all, but I can't imagine what it's like to be on a stage and have a hundred people, let alone thousands of people when you walk out screaming and, and mm-hmm. going banana. Is that, is that just like a God's wand all over you? <laughs> oh yeah. All over you. Electric. I mean, it, 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 it'll, it, it will send a lightning bolt up your spine, man. I mean, there's nothing I had seen, like you said, I had seen it from, from the crowd side for so many years and seeing it from the crowd side made up my mind, man. It, it just made up my mind. I, I felt it in my spirit and in my heart and in my soul, in my mind, I felt I have to get on that stage i have to get on that stage that's where my freedom is that's where the answer to all life's problems are is on that stage and uh i think um it was oh man just the most magical feeling that you could possibly feel sober on this side of heaven or this side <laughs> of the universe. I, I think it's uh, the the most magical feeling possible. And like Peter Chris said, I think that's why there's unfortunately so many uh, musicians that fall prey to, to drugs and, and alcohol and different substances is because it's a hurry up and wait game you know, for, for, for an hour and a half a day, you get to fly the rocket ship. And then for the other 22 and a half hours of the day, yeah, no, no rocket ship. As a matter of fact, not only is there no rocket ship, but you're crammed into a tin can (laughs) with 15 (laughs) other stinky boys going to, going to a place that's 14 hours away. So you're just sitting there going. Yeah, you know, I never, I never thought about it that way, and I've never that you, you, you have to be right. That's that's got to be, and that, and I can understand why people, and a lot of people, you know, they're that a lot of artists that, you know, they get, you know, connected with alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. It happens all. It happens. I, I can definitely see why because you get so you you that high feels so good. I mean, you know, that natural high feels so good. Mm-hmm you know, being on stage that when that comes down, it's, it's tough. And I, I've also right. learned over the last couple of years too, as I have met more artists and stuff like that, that, you know, even, even guys that are doing turby bands and stuff like that, because there's some of those guys that I'm, that I'm friends with, you know, it's tough for them even after the show, they can't come out right after the show. I mean, the guys that are lead singers, they, they will not come out right after the show because, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, doing voice things like that. They're just exhausted. They've got to get down. Mm-hmm. they're they're so up energy wise they got to try to get themselves down to a level where it feels normal um and flea, i didn't really flea. go ahead i'm sorry no I, said, I, I just didn't really realize that it was that much of an emotional high so yeah like, yeah fleetwood mac had a clause in their contract and when they would come off stage they had to be robed in in bathrobes and put into a dressing room and the door sealed for 45 minutes and they could not have any contact besides them they were sealed in the dressing room by themselves for 45 minutes and then they would unlock the door and slowly begin to say hey do you guys are you guys hungry? Do you guys want to go back to the bus? Do you want to go to the plane? Do you want to go home? You know, uh, is everybody ready to go? They, they didn't want to, they didn't want to talk or be messed with for 45 minutes after the show. So that definitely speaks to your point that it's almost, it is like you have to come down, Yeah, you know, because your heart's beating out of your body you you are exhausted. Your clothes are soaked. I've never <laughs> I've never soaked my clothes besides swimming. 
I, I've never totally soaked my clothes through and through like I do on stage. Um, and you really do have to, I mean, I've even had to come off stage and, and take a couple of pulls off an oxygen mask just to get my breath. And then, you know, let my heart stop beating out of my body. And, and then you just sort of collapse into yourself, uh, for, uh, for a minute. And it certainly is, uh, a time when you when you certainly have to it's like coming down it's like climbing up on the mountain like Moses and you're like ah! and then you have to come down from the mountain man you got to come down from the mountain and like Peter Chris said that's I, I truly believe that that's where the a lot of artists get caught up is they they don't want to come down from the yeah, mountain it feels too man. good it feels too good yeah and but but the lie that drugs and alcohol tell you is oh well, I'll I'll make you feel like that not just like that but kind of like that for this long until you get to the next show and then you get to the next show and you're like oh well I've been up since the last show and I got to keep on going till the next show so I got to do another show you know and it, it you just get caught in that vicious cycle and before you know it you're under the wheels of the bus literally pun intended you yeah. know yeah yeah that's crazy yeah wow so um i don't want to i want to be respectful of your time so i want to talk about some saliva music and stuff like that so mm -hmm. talk to me about um well i'll tell you another i'll tell you another quick funny story so the only time i've ever done karaoke Mm -hmm. was um at a at a uh ho i work at a hospital so i was at, it was at a department oh, that's awesome department christmas party um right. and at karaoke so they're like who wants to do what so i pick click click boom all right no way yeah, yeah. so I, i'm gonna awesome. do this right so i i okay the alcohol told me i could do this the reality was not a chance in hell okay so <laughs> it said, and it was at a holiday in which just, I just is very ironic by the way. Um, so I'm up there, I'm starting the rap at the beginning or whatever. All of a sudden I'm like to the first refrain and the fire alarms go off. <laughs> they shut the joint down. <laughs> no way. Oh, to God, I have never done <laughs> karaoke since <laughs> I will not do it. I can't do it. That's it's awesome. Like, like you want to do karaoke? I'm like, nope. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> that's awesome. So man. that's the only time I've ever done it, and it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, click click boom's a mouthful, man. It, it gotta... was. It was. A, and it was a yeah. It was a way more than I had expected. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to sing along in the car. Another thing to do it in front of a few pe a few people, literally. <laughs> right. So, so are there, um, what, what is your, what is your favorite song to perform? Is that, is that, is click, click, boom, one of your big, but is that one of your favorites to perform or is there other things that you really, really you know enjoy? what, I, like, I hate to sound typical, like most musicians, but I love them all, man. You know, there's something special about every one of them. They're, they're truly like your children, you know, um, they're always born in a special way. They're always raised in a special way. They're named in a special way. It's just like a child, you know, you, you love it and you raise it and you nurture it and you send it out into the world and you, you pray that the world doesn't hate it. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. No kidding. But, uh, yeah. Click, click, boom, uh, is certainly one of my favorites. Um, always, um, because I sing it from the point of view of the abused woman instead of the man uh, is very special to me. Um, ladies and gentlemen is very special oh, because that's... of it's uh, saying as if I'm a circus, uh, you know, ringmaster of the circus. And I used to be fascinated with the ringmasters of the circus and just the circus in general and rock and roll, as you know, is, uh, like running away to join the circus yeah uh and just every one of them 
you know, are, are special in a different way, you know, like even deep cuts, like famous monsters mm -hmm. is a tribute to Lane Staley and, uh, sort of how heartbroken I was over that situation. Um, I actually got to sing on stage with him back before we got signed at a little bar in Memphis called Rascals. They came there after a concert with Van Halen, and I got to actually get on stage with Lane and do It Ain't Like That. And uh, that was just a magical moment for me. And he was just such a special singer and uh, such an amazing band. And uh, I sort of tried to encapsulate that moment uh, in, in Famous Monsters. So it's special because of that reason. Um, yeah, all of them. All of them are special. Cool. Yeah, I wrote down that. So a couple of mine that are big favorites. Um, Dope Ride is a song that 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 for me. We we, we had a we had an episode on it was like things you turn up to eleven, you know, when you're in the car. <laughs> um, and actually, I'd forgotten. I I had written through so many. I mean, there were so many songs. And then I've been listening since you know I kind of connected with you the other day. I've been trying to I've been listening to stuff the you know in the car and stuff like that just to kind of you know it's been a little while and. Right. Um, Man, that came on the other day. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I cranked that thing up. I was like, if anybody around me can hear it, you're getting some education today, kids. So. <laughs> well, I've always loved that one, uh, like I said earlier, because that's the first song we ever wrote with Paul. Um, and Paul's just such a special drummer and a special guy. He's an amazing uh, musician and an amazing entertainer. And an amazing father and he's even had he's a, even has his own management company now where he manages bands and he's just motivated you know out the wazoo and and just so creative you know he's always been uh uh like a multi-level creative type guy you know not just a grammy nominated drummer but uh, an incredible songwriter and uh a really great manager of young talent, uh, a great cultivator of young talent. He knows how to uh, get the best out of young people that are trying to make a career in this business. And um, so Dope Ride is a special moment because that's the first song I ever got to write with him. And it was a dream to be in a band with him because uh, I, I sort of had to fight for him, you know, because yeah. of his old lady was going to make him quit the biz. Um uh, and oh yeah, there's a breakdown in Dope Ride where we kind of, um, where I kind of mess with the crowd, uh, during the breakdown and I get them to sing, uh, you know, parts of like Shout by Tears for Fears and, uh, I Love Rock and Roll by Joan Jett and, uh, get a, I get to have like a Freddie Mercury moment where I <laughs> sing and they sing, you know, and response. Uh, yeah, call and response. Yeah, call and response. Yeah, it's tight moments, and um, so that's a that's a, a total, and it's just an ass kicker, you know. Yeah, it's. I mean, the beginning of it, just, you know, you get that electric. It feels it sounds like electric drum kind of thing going on at the very beginning, and then when it kicks in, it's like, oh shit, it's on. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just a great song. Definitely. Yeah, and and another one for me is "Rest in Pieces." That's another song. I just, I, it's a beautiful song. Just, it's a, it's just really cool. But now that one was that one was special because Nikki Six has always been my idol, like just always been an idol of mine. And he wrote that song uh, for us with his partner John Michael, uh, his his partner in uh, Six A.M. And that was one of that was one of the first songs that they wrote together. Uh, and it was sort of the beginning of their writing partnership. So that song special because of that reason. And um, we were playing Tulsa, Oklahoma, and our tour manager woke us up on the bus and he goes, guys, it's Scotty Ross, the famous tour manager of like, he managed like Journey and Poison and Van Halen in their heyday and all these famous bands. So he's like this big time tour manager and he's sweet as he can be. He's like a father to us. And he woke us up that day and he goes, guys, you got to get up. Everybody's got to get up. You got to go in and you guys got a sound check today. And we were like, 
why do we have to sound check? We never sound check. We sound checked at the beginning of the tour and we know all the sounds are right and it's going to be fine. He's like, nope, you got to get up because you got to go in here. And the radio station guy told me they're playing rest in pieces on the radio. And I know you guys haven't played it since you recorded it six months ago. So you got to go inside and practice that song. <laughs> so we went inside to practice playing rest in pieces because we literally hadn't played it for the last six months since we recorded it. So wow. being the intelligent father that he was to us, he knew that we were going to have to get up and go learn that song. And because I got up and went in and was sound checking, my wife walked in. There you go. And I, and I spotted her and my life was never the same. Fate. Absolutely. And 18, 18 years later, we have three beautiful children, and the rest is history. Cool. So you've been out of the you've been out of the limelight for a little bit with uh, yeah. with saliva, but you've got to get some like uh, what is it? The blue the Blue Ridge Rock Fest coming up in September. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how that how did that come about with you going back? Is that just a one off thing? Yeah, it's just a one off thing. Uh, I'm gonna come. Uh, join the guys for uh, for the uh, like a half a set uh, for the first encore. I'm going to come out and do uh, two uh, like three or four of the hits with with them on the on, at Blue Ridge, and um, it's going to be exciting, man. It's a it's going to be it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. I wish it was closer. <laughs> I'm in Indiana. It's a little far away. <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you, my mom is from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, really? Yeah, that's a yeah. good. We're, I'm I'm from just south of Indianapolis, so okay, is where I'm at. So not too far. But if you're in the neck, if you get out in the out in this neck of the woods, so you got any other stuff planning? I mean, are you got you got a new album coming out? You're working on or I'm 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 working on a new album right now. Uh, I got the first single done. It's called. Uh, Evil Knievel, and it's you're you're gonna love it. It's an it's an ass kicker. Cool. I wish I could play some of it for you, uh, but uh, I'm still waiting on to get the mixes uh, finalized and everything on that. But it should be out around September. Um, I'm gonna try to get it out around uh, the Blue Ridge thing, and um, try to get a solo record out soon after that. Cool. So you have a band for the solo record? Or are you doing all, you doing yeah. everything? You got a band? Yeah, I have I, I have a band and cool. uh I'm gonna um I gotta finish up the 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 rest of the songs and uh I've been doing a lot of stuff. I did a couple songs with Struggle Jennings uh in the studio. Um I'm doing um uh a song with a band called Silent Theory. Uh, in the studio right now I'm doing a lot of guest appearances stuff like that just kind of getting my feet wet um, because I took you know 10 years off and uh, yeah I became a, a peer recovery support specialist um, and I've been working with people um, uh, that are like underprivileged people that are trying to get into rehab and trying to get cleaned up and working with veterans um, that are trying to get into rehab and, and get cleaned up and uh, uh, you know, the homeless and different things like that uh, here in Oklahoma. Um, and it's been so gratifying, man, to be able to help people like that. And I go and speak at uh, different meetings and um, uh, just able to, it's one thing to be able to touch people's lives with music, but I've never been able to touch people's lives with my story, you know, and, and that's a whole other level. Of, of being able to to touch people's souls you know what i mean and and uh really help to change their lives for the better hopefully cool man thank you very much for doing that i mean there's it takes somebody special to to go out there and put themselves out there to do that kind of work because it's not an it's easy my job. pleasure it's not an easy it's, it's not easy work for sure well, man, I want to be respectful of your time. We could talk for probably another two hours <laughs> 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 is what I'm guessing. I'm
Appreciate you taking the time with me, Bill. Yeah. So you want to tell some folks where they can find more about Josie Scott? Yeah, uh, just check me out at uh, josiescott.com is my website, and uh, you can uh, you can also get me on uh, Twitter at Josie Scott Music, and I'm also on Instagram at Josie Scott, and uh, yeah, just reach out. I'd All love right. to talk with the fans, and I'd be glad to talk with you, Bill, anytime you want to holler at me. Cool. All right. Well, hang on for just a second. I'm going to take us out of here and then we'll be, we can chat for a second. You got All it, right. brother. Hey, Josie, thanks for being on the show, man. It's been a pleasure for me. I, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. So I'm glad you responded. So thanks a lot. Um, yes, hope sir. you guys enjoyed the interview. Um, not an interview, discussion. I think it was a discussion. <laughs> and, um, you know where to find us. We're on all the podcast stuff that you can find in YouTube and all that kind of crap. So check us out on there. And until next time, peace out. Thanks for listening to the Ages of Rock podcast. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and most importantly, tell all your friends. Remember, you're never too old to rock. Until the next episode, peace out, folks. <laughs>